Let us bow for a word of prayer. Our blessed Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us in this beautiful hall. We thank you for making us part of this wonderful community of Uganda Christian University. We thank you, especially that you know us individually, and as many as have put their faith in you, you know the state of our faith. So we invite you, blessed Holy Spirit, to speak to us as we base a reflection on this reading. Teach us, Lord. Convict us, Lord. Reveal truth to us, Lord. And be glorified in our midst. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a joy for me to be here this afternoon, and I always count it a privilege to be invited to Uganda Christian University. I want to confirm that I'm married and I'm a father. <laughs> My wife is called Tamar. She is not able to be here today. Our theme this afternoon is faith without action is dead. Faith without action is dead. Those of us who read newspapers, I hope you remember that story that ran a few weeks ago of a foiled robbery. I think it was a robbery of a bank. What made this story eye-catching more than anything was that the vehicles that had been used belonged to the Ministry of Justice. It was amazing just to see that. That the number plates read Ministry of Justice. And the robbers had used ministry vehicles, ministry of justice vehicles, to try and rob. Faith without action is dead. When the word faith is spoken, what comes to your mind? Is it healing? Breakthrough? Miracles? Or doctrine? Denominations, religion, inner strength, trust, confidence, what comes to you? Today we want to suggest that when the word faith is spoken, it actually ought to relate to life. It ought to relate to life. So basing on our text this morning, we are looking at our Christian claims and our lives. Are we truly the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Does it matter what we do since we are the righteous, since our righteousness is on the merits of Jesus Christ? How do we know that someone has faith without having to simply take them at their word? Our text this afternoon says some very, very important statements, makes some very important statements. It talks about faith which is dead in verse 17. It talks about faith which is not good in verse 14. It talks about faith which is useless in verse 20. And the author of this text is making one point. Faith and works go together. Faith and deeds go together. It's not one or the other, but the two go together. He gives us three examples. The first example is from the experience of life. When you meet someone in need, someone cold, someone hungry, and you simply wish them well. You simply wish them well. And he makes the point there that empty words do not help. Until you do something about that need, spiritualized utterances will not help. So he makes a point from our human experience. So you imagine yourself, if I were hungry, if I were cold, and someone simply declared a statement of faith, be well in Jesus' name, how good would that be? Someone has put a beautiful poem about this together. He says, I was hungry and you formed a humanities club and discussed my hunger. 
I was imprisoned and you crept off quietly to your chapel and prayed for my release. I was naked and in your mind you debated the morality of my appearance. I was sick and you knelt and thanked God for your health. I was homeless and you preached to me of the shelter of the love of God. I was lonely and you left me alone to pray for yourself. You seem so holy and so close to God, but I'm still very hungry and lonely and cold. So the first statement he makes is, if it were you in that situation, what good would it make? What is pointing to the idea, faith and works, faith and deeds go together. Next he brings the example of Abraham. And he's making the point, Abraham acted on what God told him to do because he had faith. Because he had faith, he obeyed. His faith in God was confirmed by his obedience to God's instruction. Claiming to have faith and walking in disobedience is a contradiction. Claiming to have faith and doing that which is opposed to the God in whom you have put your faith is a contradiction. So he gives this example that because of his faith, Abraham obeyed God. The third example he gives is that of Rahab. Rahab acted because she had faith that God would fulfill his word to Israel. He mentions Rahab, a Gentile. Rahab, a prostitute. And her faith was proved because of what she did. So, Apostle James has gone on to make that point that the two go hand in hand. And the Holy Spirit now invites us to examine our hearts. When we say, I believe in God, what does that mean? When we say, I believe in God, what does that look like in your life? When we say, I believe in God, where is the consistency? Our creeds, our confessions and our actions. What we say and what we believe, how do they tie together? In the Anglican tradition, often we affirm the Apostles' Creed. One of the lines in the Creed says, I believe Jesus is coming to judge the living and the dead. Sometimes I wonder whether those people who snatch our phones during the service joined us in saying the Apostles' Creed. And if it's actually possible to believe this statement and go ahead and snatch someone's phone. But it happens again and again and again. Faith without actions is dead. And so he's making two very related statements which we need to reflect on. Number one, to believe is to live according to what you believe. To believe is to live according to what you believe. Number two, works are the evidence of faith. Faith is proved by works. Works are the evidence of faith. Faith is proved by works. So think about what you believe and how that translates into your practices. I think that many of us would pass a paper on Christian faith, a paper on what it means to be a Christian. Many of us would pass, but the question of our reading this afternoon is how much of that is embodied in your life? How much of that is embodied in your life? Let me mention a few things which we believe. We believe that God is our source, but we will not give to the work of God. But we believe with all our hearts that God is our source. Everything I have comes from God. Everything I will ever have will come from God. When it comes to giving back to God, we struggle a lot. A story is told of a strong man at a circus who squeezed, the who squeezed juice from a lemon between his hands. He then said to the audience, I will offer 200,000 shillings 
to anyone in the audience who can squeeze another drop from this lemon. A thin, scholarly-looking woman came forward, picked up the lemon, strained hard, and managed to get a drop. The strong man was amazed. He paid the, he, he, he paid the woman the money and asked, what is the secret of your strength? And the woman answered, practice. I was the treasurer of an Anglican church for 32 years. And I learned how to squeeze money out of people. So we say, God is our source. But giving to God then becomes a struggle. We say, God holds my future because he lives I can face tomorrow. He holds my future. But we bribe to get into positions. Yet we just say, God holds my future. We say, God is my vindicator. Then we write article after article, you know, spoiling the image of the other person, whatever they said against you. But in our faith, we say, God is my vindicator. Some people will say, God is my shield. He fights my battles. And without a relationship with Jesus Christ, you find them with charms. You find them with some other protection around their waist. But they will tell you, God is my shield. We make statements, Jesus has made me holy. But we don't live a purpose-driven life, but a sin-driven life. We say all people are created in the image of God. And we go on not to treat people as if they were created in the image of God. We say our Heavenly Father is a dispenser of forgiveness. And he forgives us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And hold on to bitterness for months on end, for years on end. We say heaven is our home. We are aliens in this world. And yet live as if we have permanence here. Faith without action is dead. The Holy Spirit is inviting us to examine our faith this afternoon. Not to boast in a corporate faith. Not to boast in a rehearsed faith. Not to boast in a positionally right faith. But to embody the faith we claim to have. Let me conclude by bringing our questions of application. Questions of application. So, if James were seated with you and you are having a one-on-one, -on -one, he would ask, what do you believe? What do you really believe? believe. Not what you have had. Not what your church teaches, but what do you really believe? The next question would be, how is it reflected in how you live? How is it reflected in how you live? What does the witness of your life say about your faith? What does the witness of your life say about your faith? How do the choices you make every day in life reveal what you actually believe? That is the point. That sometimes we will say one thing, but the witness of our lives will say another thing altogether. And what your life says, maybe that's what you believe, not what you say. Faith without actions is dead. This great chapter on faith Hebrews chapter 11 talks about how to translate what we believe in a way we live. And I quote verses 13 to 16. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 to 16. He says, These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus, make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared for them a city. Hallelujah. Because they believed what they believed, they walked away. 
Because they believed what they believed, they walked away from beautiful cities. They knew they had a better home. And they lived like they had a better home. We believe with them, we believe like them. But how has that belief impacted on how we live? How does your use of time, for example, reflect your hope for eternity? Friends, ladies and gentlemen, each of us must ask the question, what impact does my faith have on my life? What impact does my faith have on my life? Let us bow in prayer. We have some time. I want to give you two to three minutes to reflect on your faith. Make your faith the mirror and stand before that mirror. See what your life looks like in the mirror of your faith. Use your faith as a mirror and begin to see what your life looks like in the mirror of your faith. Blessed Father, we come to you as a community, but most importantly, as individuals. We thank you for as many in this audience who have a personal faith in Jesus Christ. And this afternoon you are speaking to us about putting that faith into action. To claim, to profess things which we do not embody is to have a dead faith. Lord Jesus, we believe Lord Jesus, we make good confessions. Lord Jesus, often we declare our allegiance to you. I ask now this afternoon that you'll help us to live in such a way that our deeds will confirm that we believe in you. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.